All right. Good evening, guys. Keith K.L. Belvin here, crisis specialist, author, and educator. And this is day four of the Old Head versus Young Head series, where you get to sit in and hang out and listen to me have some conversations with my children. And the reason why I decided to do this is because, one, as I have been saying all week, after the death of DMX, I really did not like what I heard and how they were portraying the man and his children. And it got me to thinking of my own. And I said, you know what? I need to reconnect with my kids mm -hmm. and have a conversation and put some of that out there. And I was going to allow y'all to see it because one, I think it's going to be cathartic for some folks when, it, when they hear it. Also, it gives me a chance to reconnect with my children, listen in here, see what they're doing. And then in terms of doing so, I know somebody watching is, is going to be healed or touched in some type of way. Now, with all of that said, now I've given you all the numbers of all the kids. Monday, you had Anthony. That is son number three. Tuesday, you had Justin, son number six. Last night, it was Elijah, son number three. But tonight, I have, well, child number three. Tonight, I have child number one. This is my first. But we have an interesting story. We're going to share a lot of that today. We got a lot. That should be interesting. And, and and if you're watching on replay, make sure you put replay because Jonathan or myself will come back in and, and look at the, the responses. And we know it's a little earlier and some of y'all are uh, around <laughs> acting like there's no pandemic. But whatever, when you get back in to watch this, it is what it is. So here's what I want to do. I am going to introduce you to the number one, the very first. And this is Jonathan. So my man, Jonathan, tell the people we are. Give me a little something about yourself, man. Glad to have you on tonight, bro. Um, first of all, I appreciate you doing this. Um, I think some of the, the the things that you already said in the intro kind of covered it. I think it's a very, um, very interesting approach. Um, and I think doing it in a public forum has its benefits. So me, um, jumping to me, I am, yes, the first of, how many is it? It's what, six, right? <laughs> Seven total, six. Seven total. Six. Seven total. Six. You haven't met. You haven't met your sister, who's like, well, yeah. uh, Kara has met total. your sister, so seven total. Um, and which is a beautiful thing. Um, which is a beautiful thing. Um, I am. Oh, I'm always this question. I always struggle with. Like, where do you start? Um, basic. I am a son, a brother of many things, a friend to many. I am currently a. I work for the federal government, um, Department of Labor. I am also finishing up my clinical program for it to be a licensed clinical social worker. Nice. And that is the master's part. I will be pursuing a PhD. So I have to do finish this two years post-grad and then two years for the doctorates. Um, I have an MBA and with a project management concentration. I am also a military veteran, submarines to be exact. I was on the USS Virginia. So, I don't know, just a regular brother trying to survive in this world that we are. That's, that's really it. No doubt. And I'm super proud of you, man. Um, thank you. Thank and, you. And, and one of the things that you just heard Jonathan say, which is going to be interesting because he was like doing it in a public forum. Jonathan and I <laughs> actually haven't spoken in quite some time. So y'all are getting... Y'all are getting let in on a conversation that's long overdue that we have not talked, I think, seven, six or seven years now. I think when KL was born, that no, I think I came to the house once we talked, but I mean, just actually really talk. Actually sit down and yeah. talk. I mean, and it's so, been real brief stuff, yeah. Exactly, and I think that was the reason why when I rearranged it, um, I wanted you and, and Kara to go the last two simply because I wanted to give y'all a chance to see what I was doing with your brothers so y'all can see it. So one, there's no tension, no apprehension, nothing. Um, all my intentions are, are completely honest and open mm -hmm. because like I said, when I watch, when somebody younger than you passes mm -hmm. and then you see similarities in the way that he does what he was doing with music and I sit back and I go, but you know, no matter how good you are at something, people are gonna look at the things that they, they deem negative and look mm -hmm. to attack those things. And my thing is, but y'all are not taking the kids into consideration. Y'all are not taking the fact that these children now don't have a father and y'all are going after his legacy or going after him. So it got me thinking about y'all. So I'm going to start off with some very softball questions. We can get into the good stuff later on. <laughs> so I, I hear the education. Why did the transition from the MBA to the clinical work that you're doing, 
what made you make that move or is it something that was the original plan or, you know, what's your plans with your, your education? And I'm super proud of the education because, you know, that's that's something that I lean on. You, you've come to visit mm-hmm. me at the school. And that's another thing, too. Shout out to Jonathan. Love wearing his uniform. Jonathan showed up at the school. He's like, yo, who's that? I was like, that's my son. He's like, what? <laughs> and, and when you listen to kids ask questions about the uniform and Jonathan was like, nah, it changes colors when it's wet. They was like, what? They was- <laughs> it actually so, did. They're- <laughs> what, was, what was the plan? What, what is your plan with your education and your PhD? What is it that you actually have planned? Let the people know because I want them to really understand um, who you are. It's so interesting because um, I think part of, for those who are who have walked the halls of academia, I think it's a question that we, we, we constantly and consistently ponder about why we're here, what we're gonna do when we're, we're done. And I think it is not only something that we ponder, it's also a burden that we bear. You know, we have to somehow take this privilege of being in those halls and the knowledge that we receive. And now how do we apply it to the betterment of ourselves, the betterment of the family and the betterment of the world in general. So for me, um, coming out, my first job when I, when I uh, discharged from the Navy in 2012, I started working at a men's residence and um, I saw firsthand what some of the needs that our people have and and our people, just black people, brown people, minorities in this country, but just in general people needing individuals who their sole purpose is to better humankind. Um, I saw that, but through different circumstances, it just did not work out. So I had a, had a, my undergrad was in business anyway. So I just kind of said, you know what? Career path was already started before the military. I went back, but again, when you have a calling, no matter what you do, that calling is so strong that you cannot deny it. No doubt. And it takes, yeah, it takes something yeah. in, you know, it takes a, for me, I, in my opinion, I think it takes a disorder to, d- to deny it. You get what I'm saying? <laughs> it takes something not clicking right. You know, that, you can't that or a woman from. that's good at what she does, because then all of a sudden it's lights out for you. But go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> as Mike Tyson. Yeah. You know, it's so interesting though, right? Because as I'm as I'm going, as I'm sitting there and I'm I'm in class and mm-hmm. thinking again, what am I gonna do with my MBA? Like, you know, and you know, I got offers, I got people who are saying, you know, come work here, come international, do this, make a whole hell of a lot of money, which I've done already before. But I remember why I joined the military, because I remember that no matter how much money I had amassed it, how much, you know, success at a very young age or notoriety or things like that, it was never quite fulfilling. There was always something more. And the reason being is that I've always been around individuals from the helping professions, whether it was nurses, whether it was no social workers. I mean, even just growing up in foster care, having a foster mother, you get what I'm saying? Like Mm -hmm. when you grow up, with individuals who are around you are saying that I don't have to do it, but I've made it my life's work in some form or fashion to help individuals in different walks of life um, that stays with you. No and again, you can't deny it, no matter how you try to veer it. And then the military kind of solidified many things with me um, that, you know, we have a kind of saying, talk about sheepdogs. And like some of us were bred to protect others. Like there are a few that were bred to protect the many. And, um, Outside of the war, the war metaphors, I think it is. There's a very select few individuals in this world that see the needs and they have made it their um, life's goal. No doubt. And you, and the funny thing is, I'm so glad you said it because I think you said a disorder. Um, it would take a disorder to stop you from what you're destined to do. And I think there's something to that because um, some people get fearful of their mm-hmm. destiny. Um, they know it's their purpose. They know what they were built for. And then they panic because it's the actual, what if I actually become? And it goes to the Marianne Williamson poem is that our greatest fear is that how powerful we are, not mm-hmm. the actual weakness. Now you have your brothers is floating around the chat room. Tip is in the chat room <laughs> and your aunt Jeanette <laughs> is in there too. So they're, they're saying what's up. We got a bunch of other people. I'm not going to run them all off. Now, one thing, let's, 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 let's get into this. Cause I, I like the fact that you brought up foster care. Now people say, wait a minute, foster care. You brought up that you were in foster care. Let me tell folks a little story and you fill in any piece that I'm missing. Um, because again, what, what I want to do is I want folks to really get an understanding of, of what they're looking at. Now, Jonathan is in foster care because Jonathan and I did not know each other or know of each other. We we had, he had an inkling of who I was. I had thoughts, but it was never confirmed. But I had told Tip a long time ago, I said, he'll show up. 
And Tim said, I said, let me look at the pictures. <laughs> and if y'all have it, if y'all can't tell when y'all look at me, look at me, y'all can see that the, the genes are there. So it's no problem. But the funny thing is when Jonathan was young, we were close to each other, didn't know each other. When Jonathan was a junior high school, now, now rock with me on this, guys. Please pay attention. Mm -hmm. You graduated IS211, summer of 97, right? No, summer of mm -hmm. 90, summer of 98. 98. Summer of 98, he graduates from IS211, Canarsie, Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. I walked through the doors to teach officially that September at IS211. Mm -hmm. So all his teachers were all the people that became my peers that I worked with. Mm -hmm. I lived in Canarsie on 85th Street. Wait, hold on. Don't, don't, don't pass something. Remember, the best man at your wedding was also my, like, unofficial mentor, favorite teacher, like, guide and everything. Mr. Boston, you know I mean? yeah. Bo Mr. yeah. Boston, Boston, yeah. Boston, yeah. That was my mentor. And actually, no, Bo Boston was the one that prayed over the wedding. And that was, that's, but Boston was my mentor. So my mentor was actually his mentor in a different fashion. And my other mentor, who you will remember very well, my, was Mr. Noor. Mm -hmm. Mr. Yeah. Noor was actually my God. Mr. Noor was the first cat that walked up to me in full African wear and said, are you a new teacher? I said, yes, I am. I said, you know, I've taught a couple of years in Manhattan. He said, all right, well, I'm going to give you some advice that's going to help you stay in this game for a long time. I said, OK, I was ready. He said, don't F with these kids' minds and mean what the F you say. And then he just walked off. And I was like, what the? And then Mr. Boston mm -hmm. came over and was like, whatever he told you, Minus the curse words, follow that and you'll be okay. But so mm. Mr. Bostic, his mentor is now my partner. We become good friends. Mr. Bostic is actually who brought me to the church. So again, stay with me, guys. I lived on 85th and Seaview. He was on the other block. <laughs> you right the end. One, yeah, one block over. Mm -hmm. He was over one block over from where I'm living. Now, again, we don't know each other. Then when I was teaching downtown Brooklyn, or when I was when I was teaching downtown Brooklyn, I was traveling downtown. He's living there again. We don't know each other. So 26 years later is when we were finally able to connect with each other. And again, I'm going to show you how funny the Lord works when you talk about your purpose and everything else. Two years before Jonathan and I connect, I had reconnected with my own father after 39 years. Mm -hmm. So 39 years, I was on one side of the table meeting my dad for the first time, re repairing that. And then I reached out to my dad to try to fix things that was wrong. We were good. Two years later, I now am in the other seat. And Jonathan reaches out to me after his aunts reached out and, and we were able to reconnect at that point. So it's it, you see how when things are aligned, you can't do anything whether you wanted to or not. And then. Since that time, we've been off and on and, and we've been talking. Like I said, it's been a stretch these last six or seven years. But like Anthony, I think it was Elijah said something last night, which is super important. No matter how far apart we all are, uh -huh. if anyone calls, anyone needs something like that, it'll be there. And I think the hardest thing, and this is for any of the men that are out there, ladies, please pay attention to this. If you're making any decisions that you say, I don't. I'm not sure about the dad, whatever. The hardest thing for a, a male, for a, a father and a, and, a, and a male son to do when they're distant, that reconnection is tough because they've established certain personalities. Um, and that's that's something that's tough, especially for me, because I know exactly what John is going because I came up with no dads. I was like, I'm good. I do this to do this. So, Jonathan, tell me what that was like for you because you were in foster homes, you were in different places, you had different males that poured into you. Mm -hmm. What was that like now when you come back and you now have an opportunity for us to reconnect? What was that like at the beginning? Because it, it's it's got to be a very difficult thing. So speak to that. Um, you know, it's I, I wouldn't quite say difficult. I think what I what I would say is any situation where you are able to put a piece of one's life puzzle together is a fulfilling. It is also a very confusing one because now, you know what I mean? You thought you had a certain picture of yourself, of your life. Now there's this additional part, right? And it, and it fills maybe certain voids that you weren't aware that were there. For, and, and it's interesting you say there were many different, you know, like male gentlemen that 
like poured into me and that was the thing it's just like now you have an additional piece of you like the person who you know the other half who helped make you so now you're wondering how others you know you're just wondering about yourself it's not even just that's what i should say it's not even just an experience that i had the um chance to go through by myself because now you're thinking about how these different gentlemen who you know have been in different roles in your life that are you know what we would consider farther roles and things like that like how they're going to react and things like that so it's a very like multi-dimensional and multi-faceted kind of experience but it's one that i'm glad i had right because then you now go through life saying okay um i now have the choice you know what i'm saying um there's there's instead of just going through life and saying okay um I'm just gonna do what I need to do because I don't have, now I do have. So I have the choice now. I have the choice instead of just someone saying I don't have, right? I have no, I have no power in whether or not, you know, an individual was in my life or not. Now I have the choice, right? So it's actually empowering in a certain sense. Like, right, I can have a relationship or I could just say, you know, fuck off. Like, you know, it just really is up to me at that point, right? And I think we've gone through that, um, for lack of a better phrase, that up and down, back and forth. And I, I also think too, it's just like, you know, when we met, it was me in the military setting, right? Yeah. So even in that setting, um, you know, you're still dealing with very hyper-masculine, you know what I mean? Still believing in certain things and, and ideals and stuff like that, right? And that's, okay. and that's me then, then you get out and then you go through transition and you're transitioning. So again, the up and downs and the back and forths were not just because of our history and because of where we are at the moment, but it's also just about how life just goes. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like life is yeah. never really just this straight line, you know, this linear thing that we would like it to be. So um, for me, the experience is something that, again, I try not to characterize things as good or bad because all yeah. of these things are mandatory parts of our journey right so yes. it was a part of our my journey if i would have categorized it anything is that i'm happy that i had you get what i'm saying but i would have been okay if i didn't but i'm so glad that i did because of not only does it bring in some you know what i mean bring in you but then it brings in my brothers and sisters yeah, it brings in my aunts yeah. it brings yeah. in my cousins you yeah. know what i'm saying like when i come in like um elijah spoke last night he was just like you know, you came in and it was just like this. And I got a story about that real quick, Pop, let me share. Right. Um, right when, we, when I first came in, the awkwardness was not on behalf of my brothers, my sisters, my aunts, everything it was just, you get what I'm saying? Like grandmas, grandmothers, everything was mm -hmm. all smooth. For me, it was just like, do I fit in? You know what yeah. I mean? Cause now I'm somebody's, I've always been the older brother. For some reason that always works out that way. I've always been the older brother amongst all my family, right? But it's like, do I fit in? But I remember there was one time it had to do with alcohol. Me, Kiara, Anthony, Elijah, we all have been drinking. We at grandma's house. And I mean, this is probably only like a couple of months after I really started coming around regularly. And Elijah is laying on Kiara. Anthony is on Elijah's other side. So he would be on Elijah's left side. Kiara's laying on me, Elijah's laying on her, and Anthony's just like in his own world doing what the hell, you know, just what he does, <laughs> right? And there was a split second where I'm looking like, oh my God, right? Like, I'm with my brothers and sisters. And it was such a natural feeling mm -hmm. that just, if you look at it and step back, four individuals who up until a couple of months did not know each other. Mm -hmm. We're so comfortable with each other that they were just laying there. And it was just almost as if we had been doing that our whole entire life. And I think for me, it's just like any feelings of animosity that I may have had toward you, at least, at least initially, those things quickly disappeared because anything that I felt that I was wronged quickly became like dissolved because I got my brothers and sisters like this love right here, right? Yeah. And it's just like, when you gain family, the universe always is about balance. So I had to go through these things, right? The, you know what I mean? I Being without a biological aspect of fatherhood, right? Yes, it was rough. But at the same time, 
you and I both know because we we counsel and we help direct people, right? So part of the um, part of the strength behind our words is our lived experience, which oh, no we're doubt. doing right now, right? Oh, no Sharing doubt. that, right? <laughs> so me being without a father and then coming in, seeing the difference what a good family and family support can do, having individuals like, you know, me and my, you know, before you, it was, you know, you know, having a biological, I had my, my pops, um, Fernando, right? Mm -hmm. Spanish guy. He actually met grandma one day because he worked around the corner. Mm -hmm. Like having him and then seeing you and then all these different things. It's like, wait a minute. I think about something like I'm a person who identifies as many different religions that believe in the universe. But I think about like the Christian religion, right? And it was something I was saying once and it's that God minuses and removes things with precision. Mm -hmm. just what he needs to yeah. but when he adds back and he blesses he does it in overwhelming abundance, abundance so yeah. for a very short period of time of my life relatively short period of time in my life yes i did not have a biological father but what god did is he put men in my life who would make up for those things and then when i was ready right when I had went through trials and tribulations, challenges and, and, and issues, when I was ready and I had grown from that, he said, no problem. I'm now going to bless you in abundance with family. And because okay. because family came with a whole lot of responsibility. So he had to make sure I was ready. Right. Oh, yeah. And I'm going to get off my soapbox. And, and, and <laughs> I'm not listening. Our, I don't God listen. You, I've listened to you talk. So I rock yeah. out. Because the one thing that I love and, and listen, the intellectual part, you know me, that's always going to be a, an area for me that, that works. Because here's the thing, one of the biggest things with all of that is that you didn't have to be somebody else to fit into a, a, a ready-made situation. Mm -hmm. So that allowed you to automatically walk right in and be you. Yeah, you're going to get the same lectures I got from the women, and it's just something we all got to deal with. Mm -hmm. But the beautiful thing with the kids is that all of you are going to be who you are, but the uniqueness of who all of you are allows mm -hmm. you to just slide into your space without having it. Well, I got to kind of put on airs for my sister. or I got to be something different with my brothers or I'm incompetent. No, there was none of that. And there's never been that. And I think that's what allowed, and my, my wish was always this. I never knew what, and I still never know what it's going to be when you have multiple children. I own it. But the one mm -hmm. thing that I have always loved is the fact that all of you having each other and staying in contact with each other, which is something that I have fostered and mm -hmm. made sure that behind the scenes, I'm pushing and, and trying to keep you guys all in contact with each other. Because the one thing that I have known and have always known, y'all going to be here long after I'm gone. And as long as those lines of communication are open, y'all will always be able to be there for each other, to help each other, guide each other, even if it's just a phone call, if you're in a bad way. And that's necessary. Now, the fact that all of y'all gravitated to the fact that y'all really enjoy each other's company. And I go back to that picture that you guys took when Justin was up and Justin slotted right in. You were standing there, Justin was standing there. We were at uh, Grandma Chrissy's house uh, for the holiday. And we were talking about um, that that uh, crazy- it's a, it's a, it's a, It was one we took when you first met Justin. Cause remember we were talking about the yeah, California police. That, but I don't we, we, that we, that. I gotta find it. I got it right somewhere. We were talking about because we were talking about thugs in Maryland, and you were like, "Ain't no thugs mm. in, <laughs> in Maryland." No such thing. No such thing. Right. Justin was trying to sell us on yeah. thugs in Maryland, but it was like even that day when we were all talking, everyone was talking from their position of what they thought, but there was no competition. Mm. I'm sitting here with all my sons, listening to you talk, and and we all got along but the thing is now once i move out of that situation all of y'all still remain that so it's not oh let's put on ears and let's put on certain ways and and, and ways mm -hmm. of acting because dad is here no we're going to be this whether dad steps through the door or not and that's always important because it's necessary so let me ask you i've been asking this type of question all week to a mother that's out there right now who's having trepidation of reaching out to her son's father to try to reconnect. What would mm -hmm. be something from your clinical position, or no, forget the clinical, your personal <laughs> experience. What would you suggest to her right now? Speak to that, that mother who's not sure if it's something that she should do. What should she do first in reference to her son if she wants to open up that door, if things have not been as positive as they can be? Because if they're positive, it's gonna be a lot easier, of course. 
So mm-hmm. if there's been some trepidation and some negativity, what would you mm-hmm. suggest to that mother before she opens up that door to try to reconnect with uh, her son's father? Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, I think you, you know, for that, and just give me a second, because I'm really it's thinking time, there's man. so it's many ways that, that can go. <laughs> I, I think my first thing is what I tell a lot of people is um, don't do for the sake of doing. All right. Talk about be perf- it. Be purposeful in one's actions. Talk about it. Right. And remember, we fix externally, starting internally. Right. That's so true. stop it. Um, before proceeding with anything like that, because that, that can be a very paradigm shifting um, uh, um, episode, you know, what I mean, once you open that door. So before proceeding, one has to really connect with themselves before we try to connect with anyone else. And, you know, there's certain questions I, I would want to answer myself before, you know what I mean? A certain level of introspection, if, if I may. So right I would start with, why am I doing this? You know what I mean? Can I handle whatever happens as a consequence of me opening that door, right? Because one has to prepare for the good and bad, right? Or a combination of both. Um, It's not gonna, it may not be all good and it may not be all bad either way. Am I prepared for that? Um, What are the short-term intermediate and long-term effects of me opening that door? But I think the most important thing I would say is, what does your child feel about this? There are many times that no matter where we're at age-wise that it, sometimes parents can undermine, devalue, and marginalize the, the perspective, um, the understanding, the comprehension of their child. Um, and again, even that word child carries with, with it a certain level of having to you know, protect. You know what I mean? These children nowadays are sub, are, are Conf- are confronted with so many different issues and they, a lot of them maneuver so successfully and so wonderfully, why do we continue to just, you know, harbor over them in, instead of letting, in, instead of partnering with them through their life and their journey? Mm-hmm. So my thing is, once I answer those questions of why I want to, my thing is, the most important is, would you like me to partner with you in doing this? Because it is not ultimately Pretty your much. decision and it is not ultimately something that you should be the primary on. If Pretty anything, much. something so impactful, how do you feel about it? And if, and if a person, an individual, no matter child, young adult, adolescent, whatever title you want to put in it, if they are unable to truly grasp that, then sit your ass down. <laughs> no not doubt. Fine. And if we're not going to rock out together, because if you're not going to support the what happens after he comes back home, you're leaving him out there more confused than when you actually had the door closed. And I think that's and I think you said something when you say talk to the child. It really has to do more with the child than the parent. You might want to repair that. Mm -hmm. But I think you when you said as a child, that's the piece that so many people forget. Mm -hmm. And those years in school, I don't know how many kids sat in my classroom not wanting to go home because they were thrust into situations that they had no say so, Mm -hmm. forced to deal with certain things. And then it was like, what do I do? Because now this is what they made me do. I don't know this man. And when I started my Mm -hmm. mentor groups, and that was one reason why I had you come Mm -hmm. and, and speak was because a lot of these kids never actually dealt with the male in a way in an intimate way of sitting down and having that 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 diatribe to be able to have a discussion. So many of them didn't know how to do it other than the way they do in the streets. And it was like, yeah, you can lower that. You ain't got to do all that. Listen, what I am in school is what I am after school and even more so. And then as you get to know them, then they now start to let you in on what they're dealing with at home. And a lot of that is poor communication and or the lack thereof. Of communicate. I don't get to actually bring nothing to the table, but yet I'm forced to swallow everything that's given to me. And when we start talking about connecting with the father figure, mm-hmm. most people don't take into account the social economic piece. They also don't talk about the community piece and all the lack there of those things. You cannot mm-hmm. throw the child into this mix if you're not sure that that male, that father is ready to for him to take on that mantle. You might just go, I want you to know your father. Okay, but does the father 
is he ready to now want to know that child? Because sometimes we assume that the person is going to want to. That's your child. Mm. The one thing that a lot of people don't understand is that when some men check out, it is hard to get them to check back in and you go, but this is your child. Some men don't remake that reconnection. If you push that child into this mix and now here he comes with the hands out, I'm ready, but you didn't check the other side that that man is ready. Mm. You set that child up for something that now you may not be able to fix. And when you mentioned the paradigm shift, that's mm -hmm. the thing. You speak to the child first because that's who's in your home. You two have mm -hmm. each other. Now, if you've already did the groundwork, you've reached out, you talk and listen, you know, he's a good kid. Are you ready? Are you sure? And you really need to know what's going on. And the, the, the other question is, are there other children? Mm -hmm. Have you went out and restarted a whole new life and went into a different direction? Because mm -hmm. you just can't come in sideways on that, too. You got to know what you're asking. He may not be able to handle all that. He may be gun ho like, yeah, come on, I'm ready to meet my child and have no damn clue. <laughs> what he's going well, to do you know I'm, and i'm gonna hop in i'm gonna hop right in on that on. because it, it's, it's very interesting that you say that because in that there was so many things to unpack right and even just starting with when we're talking about like your early adolescence and things like that i think individuals have to understand that um in this and again this is more of a like a psychodynamic kind of perspective but uh -huh. Many, in, you know, we look at individuals and how they interact with the world, how they see the world, how they form relationships. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're talking about, oh, you know, maybe lack of a father or things like that. Many of the things that, you know, we see in people is so social learning, like they've learned that because of environment. So you even kind of spoke to that. You know, we have to consider, you know, those micro interactions, mom, dad, things like that. But also we have to look at those community interactions, you know what I mean? The, that kind of mm -hmm. meso thing, you know, mm -hmm. the school, the church, the things like that. And also yeah. look at like, you know, policies that affect them on a grander scale where they might not be a direct tra um, transaction, but they're affected by it, right? Mm -hmm. So when you're talking about that family system, because that's what we're talking about, right? That family system, whether it's just mm -hmm. mom and son, mom and other kids, that right there, um, we're talking about what's beneficial, I think more than just like having a father or knowing your father, I think the most important, because what we're doing right now, um, it's a little for me, knowing that even the word family, right? And how we perceive family has expanded so much. So I wanna make sure we're making space for that, right? So even when we're talking about like the need for a dad, for me, I grew up with two mommies too, right? So that's another thing, like, I gotta leave space for individuals that are like, wait a minute, I got two mommies, am I missing out on something by not having a dad? So what I really wanna say is, if you are a single individual, whether male identified, female identified, trans identified, whatever the case may be, the sole thing that I would want to solidify is our relationship. I would want you to create that secure holding environment that will enable me no matter if this gentleman or woman who is not present does not come back into the fold somehow, I want you to be able to go ahead and make those relationships and know what a healthy yeah. relationship looks like, right? Exactly. So even if, for instance, for me, growing up in foster care, right? I grew up with foster mom, foster dad, aunts, uncles, everything, community, things like that, right? So getting bounced around later on in life I was just like, yo, what's this shit? Hold on, wait a minute, this is not right, right? Cool, why? Because during my formative years, those things were set in place. So no matter what transpired, I knew that foundation was already there, even if I didn't know it, right? So even with that mom, it's just like, yo, listen, check in with yourself. Are we making a connection for the good of our child? Or are we trying to fix something internally with us, right? That's why introspection is so important. Before we make a connection externally, we have to connect internally with ourselves, right? Cool, Do, is my connection with myself solidified, or at least to a good point? Is my connection with my child solidified to a good point? Let's talk about Maslow. He said, well, 80% is good enough. We're not gonna have 100, right? But is it just operational? Is it good? Is, is it going? to create that holding environment that no matter what comes, my son, daughter, whatever identified with, they're able to handle that. And let's look at this, like, 
with me, I had had those things in place and I had had other people that I can use as a reference. So that's why I was able to be received and to receive other individuals. You know what I mean? And I knew what family was. I knew what family was, right? So I knew like even with that moment with Justin, I mean, excuse me, even with that moment with Justin, when we took that picture and even that moment with um, Anthony, Elijah and Kiara in that room, I knew how special that was because I had a concept. My foundation was always family. You get what I mean? So, yeah. Actually, and I'm glad you mentioned because I normally keep things very generic simply because I don't want anybody to come away with and my leaning one side or the other. So I'm actually glad that you said whatever you identify as, because that's important too. We tend to forget that. Mm-hmm. And um, in that conversation, folks forget that not everybody is going to identify. And I think for me, I rock that line simply because as a man of faith, I don't project my faith, but I have to often try to get people to, to temp it what they're saying because they forget that they're projecting out what they feel mm-hmm. think, and don't forget. And, and actually not don't they forget that not everybody is going to receive that in that particular way. Mm-hmm. So when you say family, it is open to interpretation based on who mm-hmm. the person is that's receiving it. Absolutely. But the foundation is still solid. The foundation is still, mm-hmm. do we need to make this move if we are not cool with where we are, regardless of who you identify with, how you identify, because there's mm-hmm. a child that could become more of a victim to the situation that he or she is already in as well Mm -hmm. as you could be opening up the door as the parent to something that you're really not ready for, as you mentioned, because you're really dealing with something with yourself has nothing to do with the child, which is what I was getting. And I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. So you guys listen, y'all, y'all see what it is. Listen, he ain't playing. And let me just real quick, because I'm gonna change this just a little bit. You ladies that decided to slide in his DMs, listen to me, because I'm I'm retired. I'm up in the rafters. <laughs> I'm up in the rafters looking at my retired number and I'm looking down. Listen, don't slide in his, <laughs> don't slide in his DMs if you ain't ready. I'm just, I'm just telling you. Don't do that. I'm already I already got in trouble with this internet stuff. Listen, <laughs> I am not married yet. I you do? believe I have a very beautiful woman. She is <laughs> And she's probably watching on a low. I want no smoke to very All right. So, Lord, so, I love you, sweetheart. So I again, we're we gonna do this. Stay out of his DMs. <laughs> My DMs are closed. Stay and out of his DMs. The gatekeeper of those DMs. So listen, you don't have to come to her before. Well, first of all, congrats. Congratulations on having somebody special in your life. That's a big thing. I want to go back to something, man, and mm-hmm. and I want to have this conversation so folks can really understand this. Mm-hmm. I want to go back to two thousand one. Oh. September 9th, <laughs> September 11th. Yeah. How old were you? Um, September 11th, I was a couple of days from turning 18. Thank you. You were where that that morning? I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So where I you at that started morning? out in, in class. Um, exactly. What school, you, what, what school are you going to? I was, at the time, I was going to Lower Manhattan Outreach. Okay. And where were, you, where were you that I morning? I was on Houston Street, and I ended gotcha. up um at the towers because i had just finished emt training and we i was part of fdny at the time like this little program they had and okay. that's how it started it was got you a regular you guys that are listening to him please understand what we're talking about is the, the morning of 9 11 when we had a situation that changed this world forever mm-hmm. And everybody was watching on TV. I was teaching at the time in Canarsie. We're watching all this on television like many of us were. But this young man right here wasn't watching on television. Jonathan, tell him where you were and what happened. Um, I had both the fortunate and unfortunate um, <laughs> opportunity of being live and in person. Um, mm-hmm. I was there for... The second plane from the second, I was on site shortly before the second plane crashing. And I was, I did not depart for home for two days. Gotcha. For two days. Gotcha. Yeah. Two days. Now, matter of fact, I slept time, with, my high school that night. <laughs> in that time with everything going on, all the bedlam that was happening. Mm-hmm. And I used to work right there at the, the, the base of Tower 6, a uh, Tower 4, which where the, the Sam Ash and mm-hmm. the sporting goods store was right there mm-hmm. on Trinity. Um, mm-hmm. right around the corner from By Ashley um, Stewart. Yeah, now yeah. And it used to be Miami Subs was right across the street. We used to live in that place. 
And yeah, so I in that area, girl, no, no, we gonna, we ain't gonna talk about the big girls. <laughs> you gonna have you gonna have in your DMs. I'm just saying, you be easy, bro. Be easy. Nah, nah, nah. So yeah, you were you like were there for the whole thing, right and when you had gotten yourself comfortably and safe, and everything was straight, what decision did you have to make after? I think you were in the church, right? Yeah. So actually, what happened was they were um, at the time they were gonna go set up a triage on. I don't know, probably like the eighth floor or something, just to like get individuals who were really badly hurt coming because you still had individuals coming down. Um, and they were going to set up, so they just like set us up in these little makeshift teams and we're going to go. And then all of a sudden, um, the first tower comes down and it's like all, all hell breaks. You know, it's an interesting thing when that first tower came down. I can tell somebody, I've lived in New York my whole life. And I could never remember a time where New York was completely silent. Yeah. But as that yeah. tower fell, there wasn't a, like, I, you literally went from sirens and, and loud bangs and screams and people crying to a moment of, like, the most dastardly yet peaceful silence you have ever mm -hmm. heard. Mm -hmm. And then the sky goes black and we're running for dear life. So we ran into St. Peter's church, which is right there. Right there. And mm -hmm. um, if you've ever been down to St. Peter's church, they have a set of metal doors, which are open and then a set of glass doors. So we ran, we're standing, you know, behind these glass doors and we're all looking. So it's like firefighters, police officers, you know, all of us. And I look out and sky's on the floor. And I'm like, yo, somebody has to go get them. And it was like that scene in the show, like everybody looking around. Hey, hey, you, right. you go. Right. Okay. <laughs> you know, you saw it, so what's up? So I just like fuck it, like you know what I'm saying? Because my whole thing is, yo, if I was out there on the floor, yo, come get my ass, like let me know, like come get me. But no you know, all aside, that that individual, I pulled him out. We can't even tell that that individual. I pulled him inside, and um, as soon as he gets in, we start cleaning his face off with holy water. And then, um, you know, he takes a second and uh, all of a sudden, like all everybody who was like outside, um, they're like standing around him. I'm like, OK, well, we're just going to just do what we do. Like and he starts like barking out orders. I'm like, what is this guy like he was just laying on the ground. Like, uh -huh. you know what I mean? Like you're giving out orders that that individual turned out to be uh, Sergeant Gerard or a.k.a. Jerry Kane. Um, he was sitting down there to get the head of the FBI and retrieve him and take him back to command. And um to this day, he credits me for saving his life. Nice. And I always cringe and feel awkward because it was just like, no, I didn't do anything special. You- and what came natural. Yeah, that's it. And this is what I was telling, going back to what I said before I about- about there you go, yeah. You, you literally, <laughs> you, no matter where you are in life, whether you're a teenager, just going to school, trying to make a way, or you're somebody in their mid thirties, you know, in school, there's a part of you that is above understanding that literally is ushering you in a certain direction, ushering okay. you in a certain trajectory. Okay. And it is very hard, sometimes in certain individuals, impossible to ignore that. And that, that was it. Like, um, yeah. yeah. So and, we, and the reason why I bring that up is because I was actually, you, you actually touched on it is when you mentioned earlier about, your purpose. Mm -hmm. And some people are selected to defend. Some people are selected to lead. Mm -hmm. Some people are selected to teach. Some people are selected to heal. And often they don't realize it. And I think Pastor Max Lucado says something in the book, um, The Cure for the Common Life, that if you ever want to figure out what your purpose is in life, he says, just live your life backwards. And when mm -hmm. you look at the things that you could do with ease that other people looked at and said, wow, how could you do that? Because they had doubts in themselves. You would then start to see the Lord's purpose for you. And then now it becomes a matter of if you do that with the idea that I'm going to serve my faith by doing that, not only are you living in purpose, you're living on purpose. And then that sweet spot is where now you are right where God had designed you to be. So when you looked around and said, hey, isn't anybody going to go out there to get them? It was because it was for you to go out there and get Absolutely. them. So Absolutely. nobody else could actually go because no. everybody's looking at you because that was actually what you were destined to do. But you mm -hmm. also received a, a certain, um, yeah. not, I can't even say a reward. It was a, a, an honor from the city of New York. And it was one of the first of its kind. You want to yeah, talk well, about what that was? 
Yeah, it was deep for it, in the it, interesting story about that too. Um, when I left, and and I, I have to add this, so um, and because I, I it wouldn't be a it, I wouldn't be authentic if, unless I made space for this person. So the the person who the first person who I've ever called dad my father, right, was a gentleman by the name of Arthur J. Kirsten, who was by coincidence, my guidance counselor who took me in at a very <laughs> curious time in my life, okay. a very critical time in my life. Okay. I and it's funny because I tell people is that- What was his name my, again? Um, Arthur J. Kirsten. Arthur J. Kirsten, okay. Yeah, he was a teacher, guidance counselor and everything, but he, he got me, and this was like a year before 9-11, um, when I met him, I remember I hated him, I hated this man. And I couldn't <laughs> understand why. And I, I think what it was is that there was a certain thing, of, there was certain, like when you talk about healing, being in his presence made me, like the things that I was going through so transparent and I didn't like it, yeah. right? And I hated yeah. this man, but you know, and another time in the story, I tell you how we became, like he literally saved my life because he saw the good in me and he cultivated that man in me. But he also showed me that the traditional man that we say, like that quote unquote man, uh -huh. can look like many different things. He Got was it. a five foot zero, white Jewish, gay guidance counselor. Okay. Who was teaching a teenage black male from Brooklyn <laughs> how to live right. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. No doubt. So no doubt. I remember during that time, I remember, I don't even know what the fuck I was going there. I just had to make sure I put him out there. But, <laughs> oh, no, no, the, the award. So, the, the so, yeah. so, yeah, so I remember um, the only only person that I called during that day was him because phones weren't working. Um, I called him. No, only next the, cell. Only next cell. If you had only next cell. Oh, hold on. That's what I was going to say. Only <laughs> next cell. Only next cell. And it was, I remember the phone call because it was a, it was a, 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 a Hasidic, Jewish man who was on his next town. I said, excuse me, sir. I just want to call my father. He said, call whoever you want to. Gave me the phone. For those of us from New York, who really from New York, understand the, the, the how how like intense that was just now. You know what I mean? And just just for a Jewish guy to give up his phone. <laughs> the word, right? You know, and the fact he gave it up to a brother, like it was like, yo, call whoever, right? So we sat there because he had the big, he had the big joint on, he had the, you know, the big, he was, you know, a, Hasidic, he was a Hasidic Jew. He yeah, was a he had the whole joint, you know what I'm saying? The curls was tapping, all that. He had the, right? So he, you know what I'm saying? He had the joint. I'm like, oh, shit, you know what I mean? So he had that, yo, I called, I called the only person I got out because I was like, I'm only going to get one call. I call him and he said, um, and this is the first time I can really talk about the story without crying, but I remember he said, um, I know where you are. I love you. Come home safe. Right. And I, I think for me, like to have another man, to have such a pure love for another man and not be afraid, right. Yeah. To, to show that, especially in that kind of moment. Right. Yeah. Um, and he said that I'm like, no, I'm good. I'm gonna come home, no doubt. right? No doubt. My mother saw me on the news, she's running around. Like, <laughs> just saw me, just randomly watching the news and she sees me run by, she's like, oh, he's safe, he's gonna come home, right? So I remember after everything kind of settled, I get back to school and I don't tell anybody what happens, right? I don't tell them a single thing other than, yeah, I did some work, right? But during the whole melee before me and the officer parted, he gave me a card. He said, if we, make, if we make it out of this, call me. And I'm like, yeah, I, you know what I mean? Yo, <laughs> real talk is, I don't know if we're going to make it out of it. Exactly. That's the thing. Like, to know that any step that you take, like, could you be a last? You know what I mean? Don't know, and you don't know what's actually <laughs> happening. So you don't know if it's over. You don't, don't know what's going don't. on. Nobody knew what was going no. on. We don't know what's going on in Washington. We didn't know what was going on in Pennsylvania. No one knew uh, if this was just a one-time thing or this was what we had talked about for years. Nobody knew anything. They were still calling it an accident well after that happened. Yes. Still yes, calling it an accident. Yes. So I'm like, yeah, I, yo, I got to go do my thing. And here's the crazy thing. Part of me not telling individuals, and trust me, it took a whole lot of therapy and a whole lot of understanding to know this. Part of one of the reasons I didn't initially tell anyone, one is because knowing what I know about trauma and things like that, um, one of our immediate actions sometimes is repress avoidance and repressive behavior, right? Okay. So it's like, 
literally those details literally is like, oh, I'm gonna tuck those away. We don't need to talk about that, won't, right? Because there are things that were seen like that. Like I tell people that if you watch it on TV, it, that was traumatic, but understand that that was filtered. You know, they didn't show you the individuals who were leaping to their death that we watched and hand, right? And I'm sorry to be so graphic, but you have to understand that I, I am 17, right? Two days later, this is days before my birthday, right? So I'm not telling anyone, possibly because I didn't even remember at the, but I remember it was like weeks later, I was cleaning up and I found this card underneath my bed and it had a thumbprint wow. with all the dirt. And wow. I called like, um, yeah, I just want to see if you made it. He was like, Yo, what's your name? Like, I don't know. I'm like, yo, hold on, wait a minute, wait. <laughs> I snapped back to it, like, hold on, black uh man, Irish cop. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on. We, we not, we not we doing, doing that. Buddy? We not, we not doing that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wait, wait. Hold on. Wait. <laughs> but let me tell you something. Um, Go ahead. To this day, I, I love Jerry, and there's a there's a spinoff story to this. But I love Jerry. He actually connected with the individuals from my school, and he told them what had happened. And he shows up to my school. I come out. They called me, and I see him, and he presents me with my first award and things like that and you know people were crying and all these other things and i'm like oh i don't know how to deal with this you know what i mean like this attention like oh i don't want to deal with it right but i remember like the award that you're talking about is the liberty medal award exactly. and it was the first time exactly and it was the time like i remember because it was yeah yeah we we went and for me, I only, gave, they only gave him the six of you, I believe. It was only six yeah, of you. Yeah, it was, uh, I think it was yeah, five it was or like six. Six or seven of us. Yeah. yeah, exactly. But this is the crazy part about that story. I'm, and there were like people there, like Regis and, the, and the, the freaking mayor, the governor. Don't give a flying hell about any of these people, right? But I'm sitting there and I'm just like in my own world. And I turn to the right. And I'm like, oh, hell no. In my head, I'm like, no, hell no. I know I'm not sitting next to this dude. So I'm like, yo, I'll keep looking. I'm like, he was like, hey, Jonathan, right? It's Jerry Seinfeld. I'm like, <laughs> nah. So like, yo, I was just watching him before I came. Like, yo. Nice, right? And nice. he was just like, he was, I was just like, man, he was, I was like, man, I'm nervous. He was like, oh, okay. he's like, I'm nervous, man. And he, he opened up the thing. He was actually present. He was the one that was presenting me with my award. And it was the Young Heart Award which somebody actually stole, but I'm, hey, listen, if you needed that award, you stole it, no problem. <laughs> but, it, you know, that night, I think for me, it's, you know, I don't really like the attention like that, but I think that night, it solidified in me that it wasn't just a good thing. It was just that doing something that was almost an innate reaction, caring about another human, and we reward it in such a grandiose way in one instance, it's awesome to feel, you know, rewarded, but at the same time, it speaks for the human condition. We're rewarding for something that should be. Should have been done, yeah. Should yeah. have just been natural, right? Which yeah. in, in that instance was, but we should be caring about each other in such a natural way. And also, if you're a Christian, that's what the hell God said to do, it's right? To be, yeah. you know, love thy neighbor like, you know, like yourself, you know? That, so, that speaks to the condition that you're talking about, though, because of that. And I think that's that's the one thing that folks will never truly understand unless they've been in a classroom is that when you can see children, you get to see the damage as well as you get to see the joy. But you get to see where that conditioning has its, its roots, its genesis, because when stuff is happening, there's just things they're not going to share at home because they automatically know there's going to be an outcome that's not pleasurable mm -hmm. but when they're really comfortable when they're really open and they can now let you see the real them, mm -hmm. then start to see where, wow, you're actually on a road that if somebody doesn't step in and stop you, it can be very, very difficult for you because you're getting to see the authentic them. Mm -hmm. And I think there's something to that. And I, I think what you're saying, which is, which is fantastic. And I, I really want people to, to catch it is that a lot of what we are is already there, if not all of it. And, and folks, the thing is, Sometimes you need an event, whatever the event is, the, as you mentioned earlier, the external event to trigger the internal reaction. Mm -hmm. And it's the, what do they call the extrinsic situation, mm -hmm. which, which then causes the intrinsic reaction. Mm -hmm. But I think what's, what's very important for me as, as one of your fathers, and I don't take offense to it simply because I own what I was. And so in doing that, 
you then can't take ownership of stuff that's not yours to take. That's just foolish. Well, I think- Pop, don't, don't, I'm, I'm going to let you continue. I just want to jump in on that point. Go ahead. And I never want any one of you, um, God rest his soul, all the kids, Jason Kirsten, dad number one is definitely not here. Dad number two, and just to let you know when you said that, I actually called him today, right? And I said, I was like, yo, I was like, I was like, Pop, I just want to let you know I'm doing this show. I'm doing an interview. I don't want you to feel no kind of way because I'm like, listen, your position is solidified. You know what there I mean? You, you know? There you go. And he, and he had a bunch of questions as a dad would. Like, how do you feel? Why are you doing this? Why is this doing it? And he's going to ask these questions because it's his job to ask these questions, okay. right? And, and things like that. But I think, I feel that each and every one of you have contributed to my life in your own form and fashion. Like, without physically being here, there is no Pops number one and two, right? So everyone is, there's an importance placed around everyone. And I, what I want to do with this interview is that, and I'm going to let you get back to the point. I know I just jumped in, but <laughs> Not a if problem. you do have any feelings regarding anything like that, I am now making it very clear. Like, I literally relieve you of any of those feelings. I am literally, I am telling you, that those feelings are no longer valid because whatever decision that you made, whatever decision that my mother made, whatever decision that I have made has led me to places that I probably have never been to. It given me experience, whether good or bad, that have made me the individual that I am that aid. The, the ability to connect with other individuals and their trauma is because I've been through drama and I've been through some shit, no doubt. right? No so doubt. my thing is, you're in my life, no telling how I end up. This journey was part destiny, part ownership of personal choices. Mm-hmm. But when you look at it, and we're still on it, you know, sometimes we talk in this like final, like, oh, it's, you know, where we're at right now is it. Like, no, we're also on it. Just if you would have said this, we were going to do this just a year or two ago, it'd be like, fuck out of here. We're not going to do that shit, right? Yeah, but look, we're, we're, we're now talking. You were having exactly. a conversation publicly with all your kids. But that's that's the reason why. And first, I, I had let that go for this reason. If you're going to be true mm-hmm. to yourself first, mm-hmm. you're going to own your mistakes. Mm-hmm. Two, once children become adults, all you can do is leave the light on and the door open. So you cannot I'm gonna push back on that. Wait a minute. Right. Push back on that one. Come on. I get you. I've heard I've heard you say that. Yes, that's part of it. And I think it is one of the most challenging parts about leaving the door open and the light on for both individuals, right? Because you have to condition yourself to be in a constantly open and vulnerable position to receive them no matter when they come. Mm -hmm. And a person knowing that that is a a possibility and when they don't do it, it it can have some adverse effects. But But think about it. Have you ever not had an opportunity when I say that, that's what I mean. No, 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 no. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, that's, I'm but that's, with you. The hardest, thing, no, no, the hardest thing is what you can't do is mm-hmm. that, and I think we're, and, and it goes back to what you're saying is, I've never said the other fathers. I've never looked at it that way. I actually like when mm-hmm. other men step up when a man can't, because if you're being honest, and this is one of the mm-hmm. things in sharing with other men. Yeah. I've always said to other men, don't ever step in the way of a man that wants to do what you're not doing simply because you have to be honest with yourself. Now that pain that a lot of men and myself have suffered, if you caused it, you cannot get upset by that. You have to no, deal with it. No, no, no. Yeah. And what I'm saying is because for it to be an issue of the multiple yeah. fathers, the key is, is the kid where you would like the kid to be? And if the mm-hmm. answer is yes, cool. Because if it's no, then what are you offering to try to help change? If like, if you were, if you were out here, on like, some, and I've seen it with, with family members who come to the mm-hmm. door and they're drugged out. At that point is, whoa, what can I, what help? If you know, can you offer? But I think mm-hmm. what happens is in the conversation is you have to allow the kid to decide. Once you're an adult, it's mm-hmm. on the child. I think what happens is some folks will try to invoke the, the parent card. Well, I'm your dad, yeah, I'm your mom. No, no yes. you're not. Yes, it's actually, it, it, yes. it's the name only. So at mm-hmm. a certain point, and that actually happens much before the kid gets grown, believe it or not. Most mm-hmm. parents don't realize that. A 10-year-old could decide, I'm done with you. And there's Absolutely. nothing that you can do because once the child realizes that if I can withstand the beating, 
<laughs> you ain't got mm -hmm. nothing else. So yeah. I'm good. So what I do is, and like I said, I can sit here and listen to you all day simply because the goal is you're here and I know you're good. So at that mm -hmm. point, and there's a whole lot that anybody watching is not going to know that you and I know behind the scenes as well. And mm -hmm. the little things that we talked about earlier when you reached out to me too. Yeah. Those are things that because no one's ever going to have the full picture, they're never going to truly understand. So for me, the goal, mm -hmm. the, the goal for this was exactly what it was tonight. That's the Absolutely. reason why I waited. Absolutely. That's the reason why I waited to have you and Kiara at the end because mm -hmm. I want folks to be able to listen to you, mm -hmm. hear you, and understand where you are now because mm -hmm. no one is really going to fully understand how you got here. And it mm -hmm. would take much longer than an hour or so to be able to cover that whole path. And some of that path doesn't need to need to be covered simply because there's nothing that we can do about it today. Mm -hmm. As I was looking with DMX, and that's why I said what DMX triggered is that once he's gone and the fact that he might have thought he had time, which many of us do, and mm -hmm. time is, is, is relevant at best because no man can master it, no man knows ain't no person. <laughs> so in this aspect, mm -hmm. why not take that opportunity? And if you had said no, I was okay with it too, because yeah. again, to let other people in to watch what we're talking about. When they mm -hmm. don't know the full history, they don't even know the weight of this mm -hmm. conversation, quote unquote, yeah. and, and how it would, mm -hmm. you know. And, and the reason why I wanted to do that is because, one, I honestly be believed all of you mm -hmm. were capable to be in this position to have that conversation. And with your mm -hmm. sister going last, it was on purpose because I want people to be able to hear her. But I wanted them to see her brothers first because it's not about me. I just happen to be the facilitator to say, come. But yeah. the goal was to allow everybody watching to say, wow, look at the kids. Because what happens is when I'm out talking and I'm doing the things that I do, often you'll hear me talk, you hear me do it, I counsel or whatever. But how many counselors and how many folks will actually say, I'm going to do you one better. I'm going to let you see into what was my situation because you hear me mention the numbers, you hear mm -hmm. me mention it. Now I want you to be able to see. And that is the cathartic part. Yeah, it's that, the proper use that of is the part. It's literally and the what it also self. does, it brings you guys closer uh -huh. together because, again, y'all are going to have more time on this planet than me. Mm -hmm. So as long uh -huh. as y'all stay tight and everything is good, and actually all of your brothers and sisters have come in. I think Kiara was just here. I didn't get a chance to look. I see Kiara popped in as well. So mm -hmm. now with all of you here and Justin just popped in as well, that means that on all four nights, mm -hmm. all five of y'all, have interacted some way, somehow on each of these nights. That was the purpose. And I and I happened to be here to be able to see it. That was yeah, the goal. That's what I was speaking to. When you said, leave the light on in the dope. And I say, yeah. And what I was finishing up with is that's important, but reminding people yes. that the light is on. That yes, was it's my, here. That's what I wanted to follow it's, up with. It's right? here, yeah. We it's can here. do that, but as life, we become distracted, the, you know what I mean? All these different things. And then issues with time, some issues simplify and some issues get complicated with time, no doubt, right? No doubt. But just reminding individuals that there is a lane for healing. There's a lane for clarification. There's a lane for just telling you to go fuck off because I'm hurt. Like exactly. there's a lane for exactly. all of this, there's space for all of that. Exactly. And, and I think for me, even being a parent and being a brother and things like that, I have to leave space for me to, to be the person who may hurt you. But I also have to leave space for you to come in and say, I'm hurt. And this is this is the way I need to heal with you. And well, this is what you. I need from you. But in order for that person to feel comfortable doing that and even to even approach that, they have to sometimes, I'd have to, but they sometimes need to be reminded that that lane is open. And like you said, that door is open yeah. and that light is on. And I think, you know, as we as we get older. And we have our, you know, our, our lives are developing and evolving from you. I think it's, it's very important. This is very important in certain instances to remind, you know, you all of us that, Hey, by the way, because there may be a situation that requires some looking back. No doubt. Right? No doubt. And just knowing no that doubt. that door is open and that light no is doubt. on, that can do it. It may not have had the same effect if it happened like 10 years ago. Of course. Oh, no doubt. When, again, yeah. like you said, there are certain things that, we'll just never be able to rectify in a sense, but we can be forward looking. We can be forward focused and build. That's what you know, we can and do. You know where that balance comes? You know where that mm -hmm. balance comes to? It comes with your siblings. 
because what happens is it's like if if I've been to the club mm-hmm. and you go, yo, is it, hot, is it a hitting spot? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've been there a few times. Yo, I know this. Yo, it's good. That's my man. So now when you look at it and I spoke to Pops, yo, reach out or whatever. Now, what that does, it, it takes away some of the apprehension. It's not going to remove it completely. But if at least you go, you know what, let me let me call my brother because it's a little different reaction, a different connection that you have. And that's why it's so important for me and always has been that you guys are cool with each other, because then this mm. way you always have an end, even if you don't. Let's go back to that Christmas when y'all came by the house. Y'all called Elijah. Yo, Pop gonna let us go by. That's exactly what I'm talking. Yeah, come there. Come on by. The door's always open. But if you mm-hmm. can't reach me, or even if you because listen, all of us, no matter how old we get may still be a little apprehensive depending on what the situation is. But if I know I got someone I can reach out to to ask or to say whatever, that's fine because it, you still have a literal one that's coming up behind you that may mm-hmm. have questions that I may not be able to answer that you'd be able to say, well, this is what it was for me. So again, when you add that piece, and we still have one more that has not come back to the fold that when she does, and hopefully she does at some point, she's going to have questions and hopefully It's when I'm here because, unfortunately, she doesn't have a great grandmother and grandmother that she would be able to get that from. But whenever that is, all of you having had the stories, having had interacted with each other, again, those stories are allowed to be there. So when your younger sister actually starts to get old enough to ask her questions, they come from an honest and open place because you were able to share with each other already. If that's in place, then all of y'all are going to do better because my goal was always have y'all do better than I was because if y'all do better than I was, then y'all are automatically ahead of me, which means your children and everybody else's children, everybody else as they get there will be like, cool. And some things they'll never face because of what you've learned now, because Mm -hmm. of who you are now. And it has nothing overtly with me, but if I played a role in it, cool. And if I didn't in some aspects, that's cool too. That's what I mean when I talk about leaving lineup because no, you can't, you're not, and, I, and I'm with you with if people know. So one of the reasons why is I make myself accessible is also one of the reasons why I talk about it. So if anytime you pop on anything, you'd be like, let's see what he's saying. About it. You ain't never going to mm-hmm. say anything negative simply because you always have to know there's somebody that might have a question. Hell, I got some students that reach out 20 something years later, be like, yo, B, man, why you suspend? Mm-hmm. Damn, bro, you still holding on to that? Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that's what it is. But listen, guys, a tip said our home is always open. Hey, hey, easy, easy. These cats eat. Yo, stop playing. I, yo, see yo, I feel you. But listen, guys, listen. Let me let me tell you something. Y'all see it. This is number one. This is number one. And don't play. You reach out. You better come listen. Oh, don't don't listen. do it. Don't, don't do, do it. it. You better, you better be ready to go. On delivery. But let me just say something, and, and we're going to close out with this. And I think Jonathan hit on a lot of things. And, and as a father, as one of the fathers, I ain't no problem. I love it. As one of the fathers that was here, what I loved is being able to sit and listen. Because here's the thing that's funny. When I sit with your grandfather, and you got to meet him too, mm. he'll say things like, I wish I had, I wish I had. And I have to stop him and go, don't worry about what you didn't do. The last 13, 14 years have been what it was because I needed you more at 39 than I did at 19. Cause 19, I wouldn't have heard you 19. Mm-hmm. You wouldn't have talked. That's how I'm That's how I understand everything that you're saying. When you go, if it was 10 years ago, even more, because at each stage, there's a different need. As you mm-hmm. talked about Maslow earlier. Now, many of us never get to the self-actualization part because it's very difficult. Mm-hmm. And then they actually changed the Maslow chart by saying true self-actualization is when you can help somebody else become self-actualized. So what that means for us in our communities of color is that when we can get to the point that you help somebody else become exactly who God created them to be, you've done yeoman's work. And so I tell your grandfather all the time, you don't have to feel bad about what you didn't do. Understand that just the fact that I know I can call if I have a question, that's that's good enough because I was already self-sufficient at 39 anyway. Mm -hmm. So then when you came after that, again, I can offer answers to whatever question that you have. And then whatever you're going to decide to do, and I think you said something that's super critical, is that the one thing that it gives you is true freedom to decide what you want to do, how you want to do it, when you do it. So, guys, listen, this is turning out to be more than I could have thought, and I'm super excited about now. It's been changed, not Monday, (laughs) Saturday night, 830. I get to sit here with my daughter. (laughs) <laughs> Sierra, Era, Era B, 
She's going to be here Saturday, 8.30, and we're going to sit, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in, in, in connecting and listening to her. And I want you to guys know, when I made this decision to let you in on sitting with us and, and hearing us, none of this is scripted. I want to say this right now. I want you to be very clear. I'm just sexy I like that. Well, <laughs> you keep that to yourself, bro. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so you playing. When somebody slides your DMs, I don't, nah, want, to, I don't, I don't want to call nah, like, yo, nah. Pops, how do you deal with because. Now my lady don't want to talk to me. I'm like, bro, I can't help you, bro. Because I tried to warn you when you was burning sage trying to do Barry White stuff. Uh, so, so girl, anyway. Pops, so also, too, make sure before you leave, make sure we just, you know, we want to give a big shout out, a big thank you, and we love you to all the women, both past and present in our life. Oh, And for any woman that we haven't been the best of our version of ourselves, we want to tell you that we apologize and that, you know, the one way we are showing you that we are... Um, growing is that we know better and now we are doing better so we want to also make space for those who have been in our past that haven't had so, the best experience with us so we want to tell you you know how i know so, you don't you know how i know you don't follow me oh uh, because i do that on a regular basis but okay so you're you, for you I, I yeah i know that you don't follow me because if you actually had listened to me i'm a crisis specialist who specialize in working with women between the ages of 35 and 70 who have dealt with men like myself because mm. i have offered a a, a, a I do this for real for women that have been hurt by men like I was. So not only oh, yeah. have I offered that apology, I put it in writing. It's in a book <laughs> as well as oh. well as I have become that protector when I used to be the wolf. But it's OK. But for my son, because he requested it to all of the women for like the hundredth time, I will say, <laughs> and it, it's coming from a great place. No, I'm being very real. One of the things that I am as a man of God is that I have to be I have to own the things that I've done. And I have no problem with saying that many of you have heard me say I apologize for everything that I've done. And I've always mm -hmm. meant that simply because to all of the women and I mm -hmm. made sure I spoke to every one of the boys here as well as I'll say the same to care. Mm -hmm. I will say nothing negative about your mm -hmm. mothers on this. And I have not. I pray for you and your mothers every night. And the reason why is because I hold no animus and I cannot control how somebody feels about me. But the thing I will not do is I will not put a negative frequency or negative words into the air when mm -hmm. things have been done. What has been done yesterday is done. I cannot control that. All I can Love control you. is today. And what I do is keep that door open for other women who do not have someone like me in their lives who are actually going to admit what they've done. Part of what this is right here was an opportunity for you to see what it could look like if you're going through the same situation. So now I don't have no problem with my son's request because as I said, I do this on a regular. But if you don't know mm -hmm. that and if you're coming here because you follow Jonathan here, that's fine. I am Keith K.L. Belvin, crisis specialist. I specialize in helping women between the ages of 35 and 70 who are dealing with the pain that was caused to them or in a relationship with somebody like the man that I used to be. I am the person that you come to to fix it because I put my pain, my trash, my dirt out in front first. It's the reason why I wrote a book called From Gigolo to Jesus, because I told you everything. All of these children that you are going to meet with Kiara being the next one on Saturday are mentioned in the book because I put it out there because I want you to understand how a man goes from what I was to what I am. And it's not because of me, it's because of God and my wife. So to every woman who has ever suffered at the hands of a man emotionally, physically, and spiritually, I apologize because I guarantee you many of them had no idea mm -hmm. of the damage that they were causing. Now, with that said, son, while you were over there burning your sage, and Lord yeah. knows what's going to come next. Got to do it for the ladies, man. Got to do it for the ladies, man. He just keeps saying doing it for the ladies, and then you talking oh, about apologizing to, to your woman. Got to do it for the queens, man. Got to do it for the queens, man. Always, All right. You, you go ahead. And when, when your DMs blow up, I don't want to hear your dad. Why is she mad at me? Because you invited him. Keep on yeah. doing it for the ladies. <laughs> give, Those DMs give these go folks, right to wife for you, so y'all better stop. <laughs> there you go. Give these folks, give these, leave these folks with something. And again, I want to say thank you. I'll say it again after mm -hmm. you're done, but I want to say thank you. I appreciate you because, yes, you could have said no. Always. And I was hoping that you didn't because I wanted folks to see what I've already known. But since mm -hmm. we haven't talked in so long, I was more interested than any of them because I wanted to sit and listen. So thank you for sharing. Thank you for being your genuine self. And thank you for just being here. I love you. Love and I so appreciate much. you being here. So go ahead and let these folks know something. Um, um, like at the end of third mile, tell these folks something that they don't know about. <laughs> Eight um, miles, excuse me. I, I think for me, I just, you know, for me, for everybody, um, especially considering the times that we're in right now, um, wake up every morning and, and make it purposeful. Um, don't forget that one of the greatest connections that we need to maintain is a, a connection with ourselves. 
a connection with some form of higher power, something above, you know, yourself. And don't forget to live. I think so many, so many of us have gotten into autopilot, survival, self-preservation, and we've forgotten to live. And whatever that looks like for you, just reconnect with it. Reconnect with your purpose. Listen to your mind. Listen to your heart. Make sure that they meet and they marry. And um, don't forget to love. And um, don't forget to be loved. So with that being said, um, a special shout out to my Black women in your inter intersectional existence. I love you. I recognize you. I respect you. I value you. I not only protect you, but I exalt you to the highest of highs because you deserve it. You are deserving. You are worthy. And when the world has turned their back, ostracized and oppressed you, understand that there are men, in particular Black men, who will always always see your value and love you for who you are and who God has blessed us with you. So that's really it. And I'm Nick. You know what I mean? I got walk the dog and I got to go shoot some guns tomorrow. So I got to wake don't, up early. Don't break out yet. Let me just say goodbye to everybody. <laughs> Listen, guys, that's Jonathan Stewart right there. Give him your Instagram. Give him your Instagram so oh, they can come uh, and find you to follow you. At peace with me. At peace. Oh, shit. I, yo, pop. At, you at, 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 under, at underscore peace, peace underscore me. There you go. At IG. So it's yeah. at underscore peace underscore with underscore me mm -hmm. on IG. Check them out. Follow. Yeah. And also, too, them. you can donate to Rose's Bounty. Rose's Bounty is a food pantry that I support and I work with and things like that. They feed um, veterans that are unstably housed. And also, too, I am my my all all my boys shop. Um, it will be on Facebook and my Instagram. It is a uh, children's line for male, um, male identified children and stuff like that. Also, come back, actually, come they back make adults. Group. Come back they in make the group. Adults too. Come back in the group and put the links in. I, I put all the links, all the links. I got yeah, you. Yeah, put all the links. Also, your IG page because that's another thing too. Hold I want you guys to support all your business and stuff and like no that. No DMs, no DMs, and please. No, no DMs. DMs. And what you do no is when business. you come back, when no you come business. back, when you come back to look at the um. To look at the replies and stuff like that, the messages, yes, drop everything there because I think you had your brothers and quite a few people that was in tonight, but mm -hmm. definitely drop those in there. And guys, make sure you support everything that he puts down, actually what all the kids are doing, simply because this is what we do. And it's not about talk and it's about doing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was challenged not too long ago. I have a hashtag that says we can fix this. My other hashtag is bring me your pain. And mm -hmm. I chose those two mm -hmm. hashtags simply because I asked people to come to me. And if I'm asking you to come to me, well, that's what I'm going to show you here. So that's mm. what we're doing. So again, I want to say to everyone watching, I hope that we've brought value to your life tonight. I hope that we've given you something to think about. Um, I hope we've offered some type of peace of mind. And if you need to speak to someone privately, reach out. I'm here. Um, this is what I do. I counsel every day. Um, I just got off a session earlier today. Reach out. My information is on my page. And understand that I'm here to help fix. Um, you cannot change the past. And one of the things that I do in my counseling sessions, I do it this way. It's three-dimensional thinking. We're going to go in the past to get the information, not the emotion. We're going to bring it forward so we can work on it together. So then we can actually start to alter the future that you want to live in. I so like that one, by the way. I'm going to borrow that. No, it's all right. Just put my name to it. Don't check. Don't gotcha. it. I want I want to quote my name to it because if I see it anywhere nah, else, good, good, I get a, a, a cease and desist letter. <laughs> You'll get a cease and desist email saying, take my stuff down. I don't want to hear it. But no, it, you can use it because what happens in good counseling starts with you don't want to trigger a person into something that they can't control. So we're going to go back and get information because the information of what was allows me to deal with the what is. And then now we've altered the what will be. And so, see, I can switch it. So it, however you want to use it. But this is what we do, because in the end, it starts with you first saying, I need somebody to help me. I can't help you if you don't reach out. And this is what I wanted to do to allow you to see behind the veil of the council. I wanted to see behind the veil. You've heard me talk about my children. You've heard me talk about my situation. You've heard me talk about the relationship with their mothers. Now you get to see the product and you get to hear them talk. And you get to see that I am proud that all of them have turned out well. All of them have turned out in, in, in very positive ways, and they've overcome a lot of hurdles. Many of those hurdles I placed there myself. And if I could do it all over again, I would change it, but we can't, so we live for today. And today is a great day to start moving forward because you know what, as DMX realizes, his family realizes, there'll come a day that you don't have the person that you say you love, mm -hmm. and you won't get the chance to tell them that you love them. I know that firsthand, 
And so I, I think we all have. So again, I want to say thank you for tuning in tonight. I am Keith Gale Belvin, crisis specialist, author, educator, but more importantly, father. And of course, I'm a man of God. I wouldn't do it if I wasn't. Have a wonderful night, guys. Thank you. Tune in Saturday. Okay. Write this down. Saturday, 830. You get to meet the daughter, Kiara, ever be on Instagram. And she'll tell you about her businesses. She'll tell you everything that's going on. I have no idea what she's going to share. So I am excited and I'm looking forward to it. Have a great night. Jonathan, my man, I love you, bro. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Love you too, man. Appreciate See you. you. We'll talk soon. Have All a good right. night, bro.